in the issues of race, it's always about economics. Think about this. The bus boycott in Alabama with uh, Rosa Parks. For a year, black people didn't ride the bus. So it was not the fact that white people had a, a moral capitulation. It was the fact that they lost revenue for a year that then made them go on and integrate the buses. So it's always about economics. Always about it. 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 Black diamond. Black diamond. Black diamond. Black diamond. Sixty years ago, J. Edgar Hoover was asked a question at a conference. The question was, Mr. Hoover, the former director of the FBI for how many, God knows how many years, Mr. Hoover, what is the most pressing problem in the United States of America today? That was the question. He gave a two-word answer. Black Diamond. Code Keepers, welcome to episode two of Generational Flip. This one is called, We Will Be Wealthier. We. Emphasis on we. This one, we're going to focus on things that we can do differently as a collective to improve the financial standing of the collective. So, we will be wealthy. We decided we were going to get married way before he even proposed. He he planned out the whole wedding. He planned out the date, the wedding, everything before he even proposed. OK, so I knew it was coming and I said, oh, well, I need to go make some more money. And I said, you know what? I think I want to go make fifty thousand dollars next week. And he thought, you know. Like anybody else is just like, I wish I had $50,000. Right, right, right. No, no, no. <laughs> By the end of next week, I had made $50,000. Okay. <laughs> and I had no clue how I was going to do it when I had said it. I just simply made the goal. That by the end of next week, I'm gonna make fifty thousand dollars. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, and then I sat down and I stressed and da 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 da, and I figured out how I was gonna do it. Mm-hmm. He has now watched me do that over and over and over and over again, to the point where even as I start to go into my phase of oh, how am I gonna do it? Like now, I say things like, mm, in the next three months, I want to make two fifty. Okay, he don't even he get the he get the planning. All right, and then we gonna go to Turks and Caicos. And like, like it's not even yeah. it's not even a thought to him anymore. So he has watched uh, what he calls the power of my manifestation, where that is one of the top things I was taught by my mother is manifestation. My mother would manifest anything. Mm-hmm. Like, she really has taught me the power of your mind. And, you know, we could be sitting there in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sweltering building. And my mother would tell us to pretend like we were at the Arctic. And she would be like, don't you feel the cold breeze coming over you? Don't you see the icebergs? Mm. Oh, you're so chilly. Mm. And she taught us the power of using your mind to manifest your circumstances. And I have done that with every single stage of my company. And when I knew this was real, I was at Prudential one day and it was freezing cold outside. And I was walking back with a group of my colleagues from this restaurant and it gets really cold in Jersey. And everybody was freezing. And I said, oh, are you all not familiar with the power of your mind? Mm -hmm. Are you not familiar with manifestation and how you can tell yourself that you're in a whole different situation and change your body temperature? And everybody laughed at me and they thought I was nuts. So I just started going, oh my gosh, look at the palm trees. Oh, 
I'm in Jamaica right now. Oh, <laughs> look at the sand. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so hot. They said, Angel, you're starting to sweat. Hmm. I said, I know. Because I'm in Jamaica right now. Because I'm in Jamaica. I have a, I have a quote that I like to use that says, if you don't come from a rich family, a rich family must come from you. I come from a agricultural background. I grew up on a hundred acre tobacco farm in Southern Virginia. Uh, so I literally come from the mud and the sticks. On planet Earth, we live in a capitalist country on an economic planet. That means that money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. It's not the most important, but it's a close second to oxygen. Back in 2012, when Mitt Romney was running for president against what we now know as president, former president Barack Obama, it came out in the in the news that he had a $102 million IRA. So at the time, he was a 71-year-old individual, but he had a $101 million IRA. When you do that math, there is no way on the rules that we use, being able to put only $2,000 a year into your IRA, that you could use those, that playbook, and come up with $102 million. So I went on a hunt. I went on a hunt looking for the data. How does one do that? And what I found is that he has a self-directed IRA, meaning he can put things outside of stocks and bonds, what they call paper assets. He can put assets outside of stocks and bonds into his IRA and let them grow tax deferred, if not in some instances tax free. So his strategy was simply this, when his company bought distressed companies with distressed and suppressed stock prices, he would load up on these these depressed stock prices and put them into his IRA. Then as his family business matured these companies and, and got them in a healthy state, those stock prices would triple, quadruple, 10X, 20X, and in some instances, 30 times their initial value. So he put pennies in and basically you got $5 bills out. That's how you get to a $102 million IRA. There are five ways that we have a mindset for money that we are all familiar with. Five levels. There's the first level, which is the indigent. The indigent think of money day to day. You'll see them on the street corner with a cardboard sign saying, can you give me enough money to get some food today? And every day they have the same st story. You got enough food for today. Not for the week, not for the month. It's give me enough money for the food for today. Help me. And they live a day-to-day -day existence because that's their day-to-day -day mindset about money. Then you've got the poor. The poor, they think month to month. You see them on welfare or on SNAP or, and every month, at the end of the month, they, they, they waiting for the next payment to come in because they are, they are living month to month. Then you got the middle class. The middle class think year to year. Did I get a cost of living raise this year? Did I make more money this year than I made last year? Did I get an increase 10%, 20%, whatever in my pay this year? Did I get a raise? Okay, and they're thinking year to year. But then you get the rich. The rich think decade to decade. Typically, you see the rich who are athletes, like a 
baseball player who might get a 10-year, $100 million contract. Woo, that's fantastic for 10 years. But after 10 years, he's finished playing. That contract is over. What happens then? If there's not another way for him to have another contract, if his career is over, that money doesn't come in at that level anymore. But then you got the wealthy. The wealthy think generation to generation to generation. On the economic side, we focus on the four pillars for the intergenerational transfer of wealth. There are four pillars for the intergenerational transfer of wealth. I bet you can't guess one of them. First is the proper management of accumulated wealth. So we can stop reading about athletes and entertainers who make $100 million in their career. By the time they retire within five years, they're either broke or in bankruptcy. That's the improper management of accumulated wealth. There are 35,000 black millionaires in America. There are 2.2 million black households worth $400,000 or more, most of that tied up in real estate. Are they properly managing that wealth? The answer would be hell to the no or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now, don't get excited about the 35,000 black millionaires. There are 1.5 million white millionaires. The proper management of accumulated wealth. The second is real estate. What's the first thing God gave Adam? Real estate. What's the first thing God gave Isaac? Real estate, real estate, real estate, real estate. They ain't making any more. I earned my first million dollars at less than 30 years old in real estate. I own eight, two, and three family homes in the hood that I treated like my own home. This was in the 70s. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying real estate. What is the third? You're discussing it. Business ownership. And the final one, you, you wouldn't guess. You probably would have guessed those others. Proper insurance. The 60% of all wealth is transferred in this country through strategic and tactical placement of proper insurance. A major article in the Sunday New York Times, by the way, if you don't read anything, uh, anything during the week or anything during the month, read the Sunday New York Times at least one Sunday a month. You'll get a real education. But in the Sunday New York Times about black people and their cell phones, you know what they said about black people and their cell phones? That more black people have insurance on their cell phones than on their lives and the lives of their children by a factor of 10. So we value our cell phones more than we value our lives and the lives of our children. That's how crazy we are. I think it, it fascinates me that other communities can sue each other and still break bread at Thanksgiving. <laughs> they will literally party together, have dinner together, sue each while other. they have an ongoing lawsuit. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and it used to be the strangest thing to me. Now, I think that it makes sense, and I think we're the ones that's doing things wrong. They say, hey, we live in America. America operates off of a legal system. If I have an issue with somebody and you have caused me financial damage, I am going to sue you. <laughs> and it's not personal. It's not personal. <laughs> but you have impacted my money. And I need to get that back. In the black community, we won't take the L. We're going to take the sunk cost. And now we're no longer talking to the person. And now we can't even make future money with them. The whole thing is just wrong. Hmm. Absolutely. In the black community, we go, oh, that person messed me over. I ain't messing with them no more. Screw them. I ain't talking to them no more. Instead of just suing them, getting your money back, having dinner with them, and, and go sign another on. contract. <laughs> wow. The self-directed IRA 
rules and regulations have been in the tax code since 1974. Okay, the ability to have alternative, as they're called, alternative assets in a IRA has been in the tax code since 1974. But surprisingly, I didn't hear about those in high school or college. But please know that this strategy is not reserved for the ultra wealthy, the Mitt Romneys of the world. We actually can use this strategy ourselves. The spark was, at the time, two, now three grandchildren. I committed when my first was born in 2015 that she would never have to ask anyone for a job. She may choose to work for someone, but that may that will be her choice. But she would never have to ask anyone for a job. So, as a result of that, we built strategies. We built I took the information, took the research and built a legacy bank a banking strategy that that receives outsized returns based on something that I had some familiarity in and that is real estate. This is the fight of our time. The fight of my parents and my grandparents were, you know, sitting at the diner, making sure that the laws aren't blatantly against you in a very explicit way. The fight of our generation is economic empowerment. This is something that Malcolm X was strong on, especially near the end. This is something that Martin Luther King spoke about a lot, especially near the end of his life. Uh, economic empowerment is our civil rights issue. Economic empowerment is our civil rights issue. My podcast is called Get On Code. Find me on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast, but check it. Minister Zumbi Shawala is very often one of my great co-hosts. He's the author of Gospel of Afronomics Theology, or GOAT. It's a must read. Yeah, principle number 19, cultural tithing. A dime out of every dollar should go to a race-first, African-centered organization. That's number 19. Uh, be a cop, be a creator, owner, and producer of whatever it is that you produce. And I'm also gonna add another P, protector. You know, whatever we produce, we should also protect, whether it's through um, patents, copyrights, trademarks. And then being a $20 revolutionary, we should all commit ourselves to making a $20 purchase from a black owned entity each week, be it e-commerce, or brick and mortar. The long-term objective is to have 50 million African people make this practice. And in one year, we can shift $52 billion back into our black economy. Another small step that we do in order to help create change is the cash mobs. Um, a lot of people have done this idea and I love it. We choose a black owned business and for two hours we invite people to commit to spending $20 at that black owned business and exactly as the title makes you think, we mob them with cash. This serves two purposes. Number one, it shows the unity that we have as a community and helps raise the awareness of not only that specific black owned business, but black owned businesses in general. Because when people come to the cash mob, they say, hey, this is a great idea. I have another idea for a business that we can do our next cash mob at. That's great. Now it has them in the mindset of thinking about the black economic community, the black entrepreneur community. And obviously the second thing it does is it's a nice payday for whatever black business we're patronizing that day. Um, the last cash mob that I organized, that retail store did in that one day what they did the total of the week before. Um, so just once again, practical steps, real results. That's what I'm after. In January of 2017, we built, started, created the Family Bank. And in 2017, we did three deals 
that year. What I call a deal is we finance real estate investors as they purchase houses to renovate, flip, and sell. We loan them the funds at 10, 12, 14% interest, higher than what the bank would normally offer them, but it's for properties that cannot be financed in the regular commercial market. And then in six months, we do six month deals, we have a return, not only on the interest, but on the fees, associated fees, which tend to be about one or 2% on each one of those deals. So at the end of, at the end of six months, we have the opportunity to have returns on our investments of 12 to 14%. And if we're fortunate, we can do, we can turn that money twice a year twice two six month loans. Therefore, we're talking about 24 to 28% interest per year. So in 2017 was the first year we set up the bank. We did three deals. In 2018, we did six deals. In 2019, we did 10 deals. And in 2020, we did 13 deals. Even during the pandemic, we did deals. And as of August of 2023, we have 52 deals closed with an average return of 13.1% per deal. My mama told me 50 years ago, Georgie boy, you're gonna have to be twice as good to get half as much. Because if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave. Because you're ultimately going to be marginalized in this country and you will ultimately be destroyed. We cannot afford to be mediocre. John 5.30. John 5.30. A direct quote from Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Now that was Jesus. Jesus couldn't get it done on his own by himself in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything significant, anything worth talking about on your own, by yourself, in a vacuum? You cannot. This passage says to me that we were born to network, that we were born to collaborate, that we were born to work together in a common bond of caring and sharing. We have every single thing we need to succeed except each other. Jews have each other. East Indians have each other. Arabs have each other. Asians have each other. We don't have each other. Sixty years ago, J. Edgar Hoover was asked a question at a conference. The question was, Mr. Hoover, the former director of the FBI for how many, knows, God knows how many years. Mr. Hoover, what is the most pressing problem in the United States of America today? That was the question. He gave a two word answer. Look it up. The answer was Negro unity. That was his answer. He felt that if black people ever unified, ever got there together, that would present a really, really tough problem for America.
My name is Spike Cohen. Uh, I was the Libertarian Party's vice presidential candidate last year. I have been a business owner for uh, over 20 years now. I am now retired a few years ago so I could focus my life full time on uh, political activism and campaigning and all sorts of fun libertarian stuff. I'm a fan of hip hop music. I listen to rap primarily. Rap and, and, and reggae and R&B and that kind of music. That's what I've always listened to. I have followed Jay-Z his entire career, okay? I have been following him since Reasonable Spice. Doubt. Actually, before Reasonable Doubt, when he was doing like uh, uh, cameos on, um, oh, not Lil' Kim, on uh, Foxy Brown and stuff like that, uh, I, I, I've been following him for a long time. I know what his music has always been about, but that's okay. As long as Jay-Z was rapping about being a gangster and being, as he would put it, a real N-word, that was fine. As long as he and other rappers were talking about that, that was perfectly fine. Victim, consumer. I buy lots of stuff. Look at what the world has done to me and my people. As long as you say that, that's okay. Then he did a song called The Story of OJ. And in that song, among other things, he talked about the blueprint for building generational wealth. And he referenced the fact that Jews had bought out their own communities and were now owning other ones as well. I'm Jewish. I listen to this and I go, yes, finally, finally someone is talking about the blueprint for building generational wealth. Jews came here with nothing and most people hated them. And they focused on their money. They focused on their wealth. They focused on building wealth. They focused on accumulating wealth. And then from that wealth, the power that comes from wealth. And we are largely doing well as a result of that. We're still a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of the country. And yet, and there's still a good number of people who either know nothing about us or don't trust us or don't like us. Doesn't matter. We're fine. Doesn't matter what their opinions are about us at this point. And so here he is talking about it. And I said, yes. What a great thing, I hope this catches on. And then I watched the media rip him apart for anti-Semitism. How dare Jay-Z suggest that Jewish people own things? What? And then I realized something. As long as he was rapping about selling drugs and what he was gonna do to the next B and any end that got in his way, that was perfectly fine. But the minute that he talked to mostly black people, really anyone could have taken his lesson, but as long as he started talking to black people, the very second he started talking to black people about here is how we aren't victims and how we aren't consumers, how we become victors and producers and owners of things, that's when it became a problem. Anyone who is telling you anything other than your power is going to lie in your economic development and in your seizing your own narrative as much as humanly possible, they're selling you a bad bill of goods. If all they're selling you is there's nothing you can do about this except express your frustration and maybe vote for someone. If that's all they're telling you, they're selling you the same bad bill of goods that's been sold to your community for decades now. And it's not gonna get anywhere. Economic development, grabbing, uh, 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 seizing your narrative, seizing your, your, your life story as much as humanly possible. It doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be all sorts of people that are gonna try to stop you, like a Jay-Z. But it can happen, it does happen. And when enough people do this, there's nothing that can stop the power of the people. They have a Yiddish word, and at the moment I can't recall the, or the word exactly, but the concept of the word means we buy from our own regardless. We buy from our own regardless. Now, the reason why the emphasis is on regardless is that there very well may be times, as they shared with me, in their community, in their commerce, selling, buying, and good, buying of goods and services, there may be times where the provider falls short but what this phrase, what this Yiddish word and concept means is they inform the seller, they inform the business owner that they fell short and they identify where they fell short and then they buy again, okay? And then they buy again. So that the community grows and learns and adapts and the businesses grow and learn and adapt and all of those resources circulate and continue to circulate in the community. And that one really struck me because I can remember how many times have I gone to fast food restaurants 
going to fast food restaurants and my order wasn't right. I know what I asked for, I know what I ordered and I look in my bag and it wasn't right. And yet I go back and give them another shot. And so many times in our community, we take one opportunity, we take one chance, and if it does not meet our expectations, we're done. We talk about it, but we never go back. So the concept of we buy regardless is we buy first, we have the experience. If the experience falls short, we tell them about it, and then we go back again. And I think the go back again actually softens the feedback. That people don't take the feedback as hard when they're coming back and knowing you're gonna come back and do business with them. So those are two ideas that I wanna share with you. Two concepts that I think we can learn something from others. We have a long, rich history, but we do definitely have the opportunity to learn from others with long, rich histories. Thank you. You know, how many people know that Booker T. Washington wrote a book called Negroes in Business in 1907? One hand. Two hands. Now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you read the diary of Anne Frank. Oh, a lot more hands, right? I wonder why. Well, it just might be because it's mandated across the country. How can we be on the same page as a country if we are not reading from the same book? And I truly believe the Holocaust Museum was my favorite museum growing up. I used to go to it every year. And in 2016, when there was the, the, the only, I'm, I'm a little young, so the only sort of uh, Jewish uprising that I've seen in my lifetime was in 2016. And so I saw everybody corralling around the Jewish community. And I said, this is so interesting. Like, why is it that everybody is quick to help the Jewish community for something that happened four years in another country, but not something that happened 400 years in our country? It, it, it confused me. And I believe it is because of the diary of Anne Frank. Because when you think about the Jewish community, you relate to little Anne. You think about her in the closet and in the attic. You, you, you empathize with her. But you don't have that for the black community. It's almost like the, the, black, the black community knowledge of the Native American community. Think about how much Native American knowledge we know. So if we, are, if we don't, if we're not on, if we're not reading from the same book, if we're not all being educated about the same subject, I promise you it's not all racism. There is a level of education that needs to happen for us to be able to have financial agriculture, for us to be able to come together so that we can all come together and understand our economic history as a united front. Yes. The Legacy Bank really looks like this. For every hundred dollars that we lend out, $113 comes back. Are you ready to explore building the bank? We used IRA funds that were just sitting there in a normal mutual fund, getting five, six, seven percent, if we're lucky. We took those funds out and created our own bank. And after that, we invited other family members to ride along because all you need is one person to have the bank and then others can ride along. What I shared about my grandchildren is that each one of them are employees of our primary business. They're models for us. We use their likenesses in all of our marketing materials. So we get to pay them a salary okay, every year at $12,000 a year, which is right at or right below the level where you don't pay 
income tax, you don't have to file a tax return. We take those dollars every year and we add them to the bank. That's their salaries, if you will, and we add them to the bank. And then those dollars are getting 12 to 14 percent year after year after year, deal after deal. If a, if, if a parent has given their child Christmas for 18 years, then goes and sends that child out to beg for a job, the parent has failed the child. Discussions with my son. What I try to do is I try to focus on vocabulary because I just want him to speak the language of money. Understand, and I know he's four, but he doesn't know how to read yet. So the thing that we talk about is um, you know, some financial terms, revenue, profit, expenses, taxes, you know, understanding these concepts. Tough for a four-year-old, but it starts to, when you start to introduce the language of money, they can, they, they can understand deeper concepts at a later point. And that's really my hope, you know, getting him to understand the vocabulary, the language of money, saving, right? That's, that's a big thing, right? Saving, profit, businesses, entrepreneurship. These are words that he has to understand. Work, daddy has to work. Daddy has to build. I bring him to my real estate projects. I have a picture of him when he was, you know, literally couldn't even walk in a carriage, right? Where he's on a site of a project that I was building. And it's just like, you know, he has to see what I do and he has to understand that he's privileged. Um, you know, he has a Tesla, it's not a real Tesla, but he has like a, a toy Tesla, right? That I have for him. And he has to understand where that comes from. He has to understand. And one way to equip him is to get him to be unapologetic about building and preserving the wealth that I've created, right? The wealth that, you know, the 500 units or the businesses that I've started, you know, if he's gonna be a part of that, how do you preserve that and pass it on to your children, right? That's a mentality that has to be taught at a very young age. So if you had a magic machine, think of it as a shoe box. And if you could put $100 in the shoe box, close the lid for six months, and when you come back, there's $113 in there, how many times would you put $100 in? I would argue as many times as you can get your hands on $100. So that's what we've done. We tell our family members, and we've said, how many hundred dollars do you have access to? And we go to market together doing deals. We do our own deals as we're real estate investors, so we finance our own deals, and we finance the deal of other investors. It's an added stream of income for those that choose to do it real time without the investment arm because we're using a self-directed IRA. We can't touch those dollars until we're 59 and a half without penalty. So our dollars just keep going back into the going back into the bank to be recirculated and to be leveraged time and time again. But for those that are that are coming along with us, going to market with us, partnering with us that aren't using self-directed dollars or IRA dollars, this is a significant stream of income. Where else are you getting 12% to 13% on your money in six months with the possibility of over 20% in a year? If you follow the guidance in this content, trust me, you will be wealthier. Grandpa, 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 crunk.
Washington. 